Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. John Burney. Uh, John Burney is a contempo- uh, contem- uh, contemporary spiritual teacher focused on the unfolding of natural wakefulness, the already enlightened basic state that lies at the core of human experience. He has four decades of practice and study in the contemplative traditions of oh, Soto Zen, Theravada Insight Meditation, and Advaita Vedanta. In addition to his work as a spiritual teacher, John is also experienced, an experienced healer and teacher of somatic embodiment via his extensive training in the Alexander Technique, the Shigong system of Dr. Pensi Yu, and the Zero Balancing System of Dr. Fritz Smith. He has been in private practice since 1981. John leads classes, intensives, and retreats in the San Francisco Bay Area and nationally. It was kind of rough this morning running the marathon and trying to get here on time. <laughs> Cleaning up, too, yeah. Just... Ah, nice to be back. I really, uh, um, some of you have been here before and heard me speak, so probably a few things that I'll share will be re- repeats, but, um, <clears throat> I actually first, I taught in this space many years ago uh, when I was teaching meditation courses for the Harvey Milk Institute. And back in those days, I was still sitting on a cushion. But um, it was, I really always loved being here. And um, how often do you guys meet here? Every? Once a week. Every week. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, hmm. Also, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, but um, uh, I believe this group uh, evolved out of a group that uh, three of us started back in, I don't remember when we started it, probably in the late 70s, early 80s. It was the first gay Buddhist group. And uh, it was, uh, Tommy Dorsey, who became Isan Dorsey, who founded the Hartford Street Zen Center and I, and another friend who is a TM teacher, Bill Graham, Billy Graham. You may have known him. He, uh, he taught TM, and uh, he was the mother superior for the, the original mother superior for the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And the three of us started the first gay Buddhist group, <clears throat> and we used to meet over at the um, guest house uh, across from Zen Center, and we invited people to talk, like Allen Ginsberg, and various people and I think so and then eventually Isan 
uh, got Hartford Street. Uh, I think he started uh, an AIDS hospice there. My tree was it, and a lot evolved out of that actually. And then I think there was, the, I think the gay Buddhist group splintered, and there are two groups now. I think one over at Hartford Street maybe, and this one. I don't know if there's any other ones, but uh, I just want to give a little history. I thought that would be interesting, just to let you know a little bit about me and my background, and you know how I got here. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, and um, in 1969, that was a that was a very significant year for me. I was 16, mm-hmm. and um, I came out that year to my family and some close friends, and I um, came up to San Francisco to march with a hundred other people on Polk Street for gay liberation. <laughs> And that was around the time of Stonewall. I think it was right around the same time. And the following year, that march became the Gay Freedom Parade. The, the uh, anniversary of that march became the Gay Freedom Parade. And I was, at the, I was at the parade with my husband this year and just so profoundly moved that, you know, with this recent Supreme Court decision uh, with gay marriage, it, I thought, wow, you know, we have come a long way since back then. And there, there I was, you're right near Polk Street, you know, from 69, <coughs> and, and, and I'm very grateful, we're very grateful, because he, we were worried about his immigration status, and now we're married, and has a green card, and makes me emotional every time I bring that up. And we don't have to worry about him being able to be here, <coughs> stay here, and be together. Um, also in 1969, I had a, um, a spiritual awakening, which was pretty significant. It changed my whole life. And uh, I was, you know, um, I wasn't religious. I wasn't a religious person. I wasn't interested in religion at all. Um, I kind of rejected religion at 11 um, and was much more of a kind of scientific empiricist. It's like, you know, when I, when, when I see it, I'll believe it. And um, I had a, I don't know, there was just a lot of inquiry going on, a lot of questioning, what's, what's this life about? And um, I was a concert violinist, uh, kind of straight A student on my way to Stanford and planning to go to med school. That was, that was the track I was on. And I had this awakening which completely changed my life. I ended up not going to Stanford in med school. I ended up going to UC Santa Cruz and dropping out and hitching across the country and then becoming a Buddhist monk. That's what happened. Because, not because I was particularly interested in Buddhism per se, but more that at that time, I was recommended to go to the Zen Center, and I thought it sounded like a pretty cool, clean place to explore what was already happening within me, because there was this whole process happening within me, and I could just sit on the Zafu and do, you know, lots and lots of meditation and move in and do Sashin and everything else, and really let this intense flowering of human spiritual transformation unfold. So I did many years of Zen practice and and then I left that. I felt something was missing and became close with uh, Jack Cornfield when he first moved to Marin. Uh, we were sitting with like 10 people in somebody's living room and his son and Selmo in Marin and then we eventually found uh, a, a larger venue and then eventually I was involved with helping helping him find the property for Spirit Rock, which be, what became Spirit Rock. And he was cultivating me and other people to sort of be the first teachers there, but at that point I felt like something was missing there for me. So I was doing my own retreats and then I was introduced to Jean Klein, who I don't know if you know who he was, but I he was the first, I would say, uh, teacher that I had a close relationship with that was really I don't know how to say this, vibrating on the frequency of where that spiritual awakening, of what that spiritual awakening was for me at 16. He was embodied 
in that realization. And so I realized he was he was my guy to work with, to study with. So that was he's in the tradition that's known as Advaita, which is also now popular as non-dual, uh, which is basically it's just re, Zen repackaged, basically. You know where, uh, and I think when you look at even in, in Buddhist practice or in, in many spiritual traditions, uh, when you get to a certain level, they're they're all talking about the same thing. I mean that's what um, <clears throat> Joseph Campbell realized, and I think a lot of his teaching was to show that once you go to once you get beyond religion in a sense, once you get beyond belief structures and outside of the realm of the cognitive and into the realm of pure consciousness, then everyone's saying the same thing. Everyone's pointing at that mystery. So one of the things I really wanted to talk about was kind of working or moving towards freedom. And the reason I talked about my history a little bit because I think that you know, for me, being free back at 16 was also fighting for gay rights. You know, it was actually being an activist and wanting to make change in some way in the world. And yet, at the same time, the inner longing for freedom was opening up. So they both opened up the same year, which I just think is, you know, interesting. And I think that's true for all of us, that we want to be able to live in a world where we can just be who we are without a problem, right? And also to be free, to actually not be caught in uh, what Buddha referred to as suffering. And I, I think that the, the reason that, you know, the teaching, his teachings are so great, I think, today to understand what did he really mean by suffering. You know, I think that the way I see it is that suffering is another, another way of describing struggling with how it is. So he said, you know, wanting what you don't have, not wanting what you do have, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, so struggling with what is. And when you understand the nature of struggling within your own conditioning, when you begin to have perspective on that, that perspective actually can facilitate what we call suffering, and really have it become the raw material for liberation. That suffering literally engenders liberation. So instead of trying to get rid of suffering or transcend it, you actually embrace it. You actually learn how to become related to it in such a way that it's not personal, and yet intimately connected with it in such a way that through compassion and loving kindness and other kinds of uh, practice, Ho'oponopono and the Hawaiian tradition is a great example of it. Um, those conditions literally become transmuted and we awaken. We open into this pure consciousness of being. And I'm sure many of you have at least glimpsed that silence or tasted that the truth of your essential nature, what Buddha referred to as Buddha nature. It just Buddha literally means awake. Just like Christ or Christos means light. It's a description of our essential aliveness. And so in the direct teaching, which I'm involved in and I work with people, is really that mentoring or mirroring of what we all already are. Not what we become. You don't actually become enlightened. You actually 
it's revealed. It's actually uncovered. It's discovered. It's already here. So that's not a belief that you need to buy or I mean, I, whatever I'm saying here, just so you know right up front, isn't about having another belief to, you know, kind of burden yourself with. It's more, if anything, hints at how to explore your own experience, how to discover the truth. Because what I realized somehow, and I actually had a psychic tell me, a wonderful psychic when I was 20, that I had many lifetimes as a monk, and I knew what to do this lifetime to set myself up to have that awakening at 16. Because truly, there was nothing in my life that would have led me to do what I did to have that awakening. If you're, I, the, the story was actually published, it's the first thing I ever published in a book called Queer Dharma. And uh, the title of that talk that, I, that talks about that story was called um, Monk in Drag. And the, and the subtitle was, he didn't want to publish the subtitle, which I really like. You can take yourself out of the monastery, but you can't take the monastery out of yourself. And uh, what that means is that, you know, the longing, that, you know, the, the, the inner monk, you know, that, which I think everyone has, is the longing to come back home to our true nature, to realize, to become fully integrated. Because the purpose of enlightenment isn't to transcend human life. The purpose of freedom is to find out how to live fully, is how to be fully human. So awakening is actually the beginning of the path. A lot of people mistakenly think it's the end. And that's, well, it's absurd. First of all, it's not even possible. How could there be an end to an infinite, mysterious, unknowable universe, right? So it's the, what it's the end of is having any beliefs about it, that's for sure. And I think uh, anybody that I, all the people I have known who have been really embodied examples of what I'm talking about would be the first to admit to you that they are clueless that they don't really, they're not a knower. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're alive in being the understanding of life. So awakening is really moving into that realm where you're fully actualized as a human being. You're fully alive and connected. And that life becomes very different than no matter what your circumstances are. You know, and most of us have, you know, can have times in our life that are very, very, very challenging. Uh, whether it's physical health challenges or financial challenges or relationship challenges or work challenges, whatever. We have, you know, conditional life is quite a mixed bag for most people. Some people are lucky and they have what looks like a you know, a smoother ride. And other people have a very, very, very rough ride. So regardless of what the conditions have been for one's life, this practice that you're involved in, of sitting and paying attention and listening and sensing and breathing and getting out of the way, really learning how to let the breath Breathe you, let, allowing, letting go of control to happen. Allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Allowing yourself to be sensitized more and more opens the natural force of awakening to move through you. It's a done deal. I mean, it just, it's, it's, Ironically, we're conditioned to prevent it in some way. The way we are conditioned to um, survive, the way we're conditioned to accomplish, the way we're conditioned to, you know, make it, so to speak, especially now, as challenging as it is for so many people economically. Um, <clears throat> 
those dynamics often create a kind of shielding, a kind of defensiveness, a kind of you know strong ego identity, which thinks it's who they are. And so when you start to do, when you, when, when you get to a certain point in your life, which you all have, really, you wouldn't be here otherwise, and you question, well, is that really all there is? Is this all who I really am? Or why am I suffering so much? Or how come I'm not, I, I want to be, I want to enjoy my life a little more, right? So whatever it is that brings you to this environment here that you meet in and practice in and maybe on your own as well or in other ways, other practices that you do. I mean, there, there is truly a natural human longing for happiness, really. For just to be happy. Just to be, let's just say, content. You know, forget enlightenment. How about just, you know, happy? How about just in being able to enjoy this moment, to be able to... Um, be with a friend and actually f have one's heart open and, and be able to empathize with you know someone else's life to 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 really give and receive in life you know what is it that really brings the spheres are speaking you know so, I, so this, so this <clears throat> natural awakening is available for everyone, and I would say that how are you bringing attention to what's present right now in your field? of awareness? Are you bringing attention in a way that holds on to it, resists it, is trying to change it, or get rid of it, or fix it, or figure it out? Or are you bringing awareness to it in such a way that gives it space to breathe, to move, to open, as if there was physical tension in your body that may want to start to unwind, or energies that are blocked that start to bubble out as you're sitting here breathing, tuning in, doing a practice, a meditation practice. <clears throat> Is it some emotion that you didn't even know was buried under there, some sadness, some grief, some fear, some rage, some anxiety? Something you haven't wanted to feel or have been pushing away, is that starting to emerge? Because you know what's so interesting, people often don't know that when emotion starts to move, it's actually what that is deeply is the energy body opening up. It's the heart wanting to open. We often get into our head and say, oh, that's wrong, that's bad, we shouldn't feel that way, uh, or whatever condition that many people have had to stop Emotion, or I need to be spiritual, I can't be caught in human emotion, or that whole trip, you know, which is a real repressive kind of prism. To begin to learn that these energies that are moving through our body, these feelings that are moving through our body, are the natural weather system of aliveness. And every bit of it is grist for the mill, every bit of it is fertilizer for the plant. So Suzuki Roshi said, you know, you pull the weeds out from around the plant, and then you bury them back into the dirt, and it nourishes the plant. Such a great image of how what we're doing here is really a kind of psychic recycling process. So all of your suffering, all of your condition, is if you learn how to bring attention to it, in a way that actually works, it will facilitate liberation. So with that attention, with that understanding, you begin to move towards what's difficult, which is basic Zen teaching. Move towards what's difficult. Or as Rumi 
pointed about out. You you should wish you should wish to have a hundred thousand sets of sets of moth wings so you could burn them away one set a night. You go into the fire to be transformed into the sweet flowing waters, rather than avoid the fire. And so we learn how to bring attention to what we might call suffering in such a way that it literally dissolves. It actually can become transmuted. Now I find when I'm working with people privately or in groups or on retreats, intensives, <clears throat> when I have people come up and work with me and there's a kind of mirroring that happens, there's a, we call it transmission, which is a nonverbal kind of energetic mirroring that happens. And when someone expresses, offers in that space, truly an expression of the condition, not a head trip about it, not a, just a story about it, but really when they speak it, it resonates the vibe of it. You know what I mean? It actually, you can feel it. Often it just goes poof. And all of a sudden the condition at that moment can be completely gone. And their state can change like that. It's amazing to see that. And people who are sitting in the room like here, if they're tuned in and sensitive, can actually feel more energy in the room, more opening, more love, some stuff like that. It's really far out. So yeah. So there's so that what, what's really meant by Sangha is such a extraordinary alchemical discovery that we realize when we're not in our head and we're not caught in our condition that it is absolutely true that we are connected. That's not some groovy, you know, new age belief. I mean, it might be for some people, but that's, it's really true. Like, I work with people on the phone or some Skype around the world on the other side of the planet, and we'll be working, and all of a sudden there's that connectedness. And both people can feel it like instantly and thinking, who can explain that? Well, that's what, you know, that's what's meant by big mind, the big heart. We don't, we don't, it can't be, how, how can it be measured? It's how could you measure the infinite? And yet we are that intelligence. We are that profound. That was what I realized at 16. What, what, what led me to that experience at 16 was this obvious, logical conclusion that I don't know what the meaning of this life is about. I don't know what the meaning of this universe is about. I want to know what it means. I want to find out because I don't know why I'm busting my ass, killing myself, practicing four hours a day, performing, trying to get straight A's, blah, blah, blah. I'm killing myself. What am I doing it for? What's the point? I could see my parents' friends and they were you know, whatever, so-called successful people, and they didn't look happy, and I'm going to end up like them? You know, it was like, back then, of course it was the 60s, and we were questioning everything. So it was, you know, it was a volatile time, but it was that what led, that questioning led me to the place, which may seem obvious to you now, but to me then it was an internal discovery, which was, wait a minute. I'm part of whatever this infinite, whatever this life is, this, whatever the mystery of this life is, so I should be able to discover what that is through this body. Now, that may seem like, well, that's obvious, but I was 16. Nobody told me this. I hadn't read it anywhere. It was kind of like, okay. So I sat down. I took all my clothes off. My parents had gone to bed. I closed my door, and I sat down naked in my beanbag chair, and I stared at the wall, and I said to myself, I'm not going to move until I discover it. Now, how did I know to do that? You know, how did I know? I don't know. And I knew about breathing from acting, because I'd been doing acting in school. And so I was aware of my breath, and, you know, it, it, this, it, there was just this amazing experience of eventually a kind of explosion into discovering this, what has been there ever since, and guided me ever since, which I would call our, our true nature, our presence, you know, our true aliveness. And everyone has access to that if you get out of the way, if you get out of the way of being here. So all the practices, whether you follow your breath, whether you do a mantra, whether you do visualizations, whether you 
whatever you do, whether you do yoga or any kind of physical, you know, ener physical energetic practices, qigong, that kind of thing, um, inquiry, all the different practices that people do these days, they're all ultimately designed to set you up to be out of the way. Because ultimately what you find is that this process is completely effortless. It isn't, am I talking too long? I don't, I don't know, okay. It isn't um, a human accomplishment. It isn't something that you make happen. We have this conditioning because of our relative reality, you know, survival programming to make things happen to accomplish things, to get things done. That's just how we are programmed as human beings, as animals, as organisms, right? And then we apply that to liberation, and it's the wrong MO. It's the wrong way. It doesn't work. So it's counter-instinctual to let go. Instinct and ego is all about holding on and controlling and dominating and having power, right? That's what it's about. That's what ego is about. And it's really, you know, a very interesting challenge to begin to understand how to interface the, you know, human conditional reality with absolute reality. And a lot of my teaching, I really try to make that clear so people don't confuse one over the other. They don't take certain spiritual truths and then apply it in a relative sense that can really limit them. In other, like a, a really ridiculous example it will be, well, everything will happen, you know, I don't have to do anything, so I'm just going to sit here and, you know, the, the money will come in and the taxes will be paid and the groceries will show up and the food will be made for me. And, I, you know, that's an absurd kind of perspective <clears throat> of I don't have to do anything, right? And there are people, though, who do apply kind of certain kinds have I've seen this happen where, you know, they they forgot that it's still about chopping wood and carrying water. And yet how you chop wood, how you carry water is what makes all the difference. And Thich Nhat Han, wonderful Vietnamese Zen master, who you may be familiar with, love him. He um, he had a wonderful description of washing dishes, which you may have heard, which is that there's two ways to wash the dishes. You've heard some of you heard this. Uh, one way is <clears throat> to wash the dishes in order to get them done, and the other way to wash them is to wash the dishes in order to wash the dishes. So you're not trying to get from point A to point B. That you realize there is only here. So realization is about not only arriving here, but realizing there isn't anything else. It doesn't mean you don't plan a trip or get in your car and go somewhere. It doesn't mean you can't use relative functioning to plan and organize and all of that. Of course you can. If anything, that will function better. But what happens is that you're actually living right here. The problem with most people is they're not even here. They're in their head. They're in their head somewhere. They're in a mental world somewhere. It's like someone says to you, are you actually aware right now of the contact of your body with the chair or the cushion or the floor? Are you, are you actually sensing the movement of your breath? Are you controlling the breath? Are you relaxed? Are you tense? Are you wishing this guy would stop talking already? <laughs> Whatever. What is he talking about? Are you struggling on some mental level? <clears throat> Are you available for what's happening for you right now? Or are you tripping out somewhere? Are you wanting, are you distracted? Or are you just, you know, hanging out? 
just saying, hey, you know, hey, cool, I don't have to figure anything out. Let's try that. I don't have to know how this works. I don't have to make it happen. I wonder what would happen if I just trusted being here and allowed that natural opening to move through me and guide me. What I like to point out, and you may not have heard this, or you may have, but it's not possible to follow another person's path. You may hear or read stories, all kinds of books today, people out there talking about things like this. And you may say, well, they had this happen. I want, how come I haven't had that happen? Or you might compare your practice or your process with a friend of yours who's had some kind of unfoldment or something happen. But the truth is, it is not possible to follow another person's process. It's actually not possible to do a path or to do a practice, actually. Not really. Let me explain this very clearly so that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. What's really true is that the essence of transformation is universal for everybody. That's absolutely universal. But how an individual unfolds and how they become liberated is completely unique to the individual. So what's important for the individual is to discover this true nature first. Suzuki Roshi said, practice begins with enlightenment. It begins with discovering your true nature. Not the concept of it, but the actual vibe, the actual however that is for you that you perceive that complete connectedness, openness, however you want to describe it. That's the beginning because that's the guiding light. That's the grace, whatever you want to call it. That's the, that's the internal GPS that's going to get you back to home, home ground as being. So these different practices and things that people offer, often very, very helpful. Whatever kind of practice you try, and I've, I've benefited from numerous practices, mostly in this tradition, um, but ultimately it was this presence that I realized had been guiding me since 16, is guiding me now, has been guiding me my whole life, and is guiding everything. It is literally the universal intelligence, it is the infinite universal intelligence that we are. And we completely don't rock. We completely don't comprehend. Not really. And yet that's okay. Because it's a relief to not have to figure it out. The human mind, as great as it is, as wonderful as it is, and even as it can be a vehicle for wisdom and profound creativity, and all kinds of things, beautiful, and it's, it's, part, it's a part of the infinite intelligence too, for sure. It often is a defense mechanism that gets in the way. Because it needs, so often wanting to know becomes a defense. Like even often when somebody has, comes and works with me and they say, God, there's all of this grief coming out of me and I don't know what it's about. And they, they're trying to know and that actually stops it. And when they actually begin to allow, get in their body and allow that grief to move, all of a sudden they are awakened. Like that. Instant. Now what often happens is very common today. Many, many, many people are tasting the truth. They're having glimpses and experiences of what we're calling awakening. And then naturally the human condition wants to hold on to it. Wants to recreate it just like people treat getting high. Like, well, that was a good high. I'm going I'm I'm to do that one again. I want to get high again. So they treat a spiritual experience like a high. Well, it's like a state, like an altered state. It's really groovy. It's great to be feeling in love with everybody. It's great to feel connected. And now I'm not anymore. I want to get back there. How do I get back there? How do I hold on? How do I get back there and how do I hold on to it? And yet, those those questions point to what doesn't work, right? Because 
as Dogen, you know who Dogen was? He was the guy who brought Zen from China to Japan in 1200 and set up the monasteries in Japan that sort of, they're still running, a lot of them are still running the same schedules that they did 1200. He had a wonderful teaching, which was <clears throat> about this, about the, your true nature. Your every step leads not away from it. Get it? Your every step leads not away from it. My teacher, Jean, had another way to put it, sort of the reverse corollary. Every step towards it is a step away from it. So any attempt to get it obscures it. You know, there, there are these famous Zen teaching, you know, koans, you know, the, or these wonderful Zen stories. This, this guy's sitting there on a zapu and he's meditating his butt off and, you know, he, and, and, uh, and, why, and he says to the teacher, well, why? He, he said, well, if, if you can't attain this, why are we sitting here? Why are we doing this practice if we can't, if, if it isn't attainable? Of course, you can't answer that question. I, I, th I think Aiken Roshi, who was an old friend of mine, he taught the, uh, he had a, uh, I think a Rinzai Zen community and practice place in Hawaii. And uh, he had a one, he said something wonderful, <coughs> wonderful years ago was, um, enlightenment is an accident. Zazen can make you accident prone. <laughs> Not necessarily, it could also make you more repressed. So uh, that's what you have to watch is how do you practice? How do you bring attention to what's coming up? And I would say, can you are you, are you being nice to yourself? Are you being gentle with yourself? Are you able to forgive yourself and give yourself permission to being human? Because I guarantee you that was one of the hardest things for me because I was type A time, you know, I used to make type A look catatonic. And uh, I was very hard on myself. I came from a background of people who were very hard on themselves. And so I was extremely like, you know, and it took me a long, long, long time and many, many, many years of intense practice to begin to get that that didn't work. In fact, being gentle with myself allowed opening to happen a lot quicker. In fact, to the point where I didn't do anything. It was, boom, here we are in this presence. Amazing. Amazing. So it's a wonderful, extraordinary, often very challenging and very difficult journey. But all I can say, well worth it. Hang in there. And I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question. Sure, sure. Yeah, let me see. So we go till noon, right? Huh? We go till noon? Uh, five more minutes. What? Oh, oh, we ended. Oh, I thought we, had, I thought we ended this at noon, no? Okay, whatever. Please Only five minutes. minutes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's just uh, I can't relate a lot to what he said because uh, I had a similar experience here when I was 17, 18 because uh -huh. I did go to yoga uh, and uh, the first time I learned about it, I didn't know anything about Buddhism, but I learned about the Bhagavad Gita oh, okay. and listening about the Dharma, so what was my Dharma, so I, I had a lot of questions. But uh, my question is, I was really afraid because I had no support from parents. Sure. I needed to take care of my own, and uh, okay, I survived, but uh, I wanted to listen from you. You had uh, a reassurance that was enough, and you didn't need support from anybody. I, at that time, I needed support from someone, sure. and I didn't have it. Right. Well, there's support now. There's a lot, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. I know, me too. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of support available now for what happened to you. I didn't have support for about four years. I didn't know what happened to me. And a friend of mine flipped out and ended up in a mental hospital, and I thought maybe I was going crazy, so I stopped what was happening. I was opening into these amazing you know, energies and states during, you know, during algebra class in high school. And I thought, well, maybe I'm going crazy. So I, I somehow stopped it. But it wasn't until I was 20, and I, met, and I was doing Zen practice, and I met 
this person who said you you know you had an enlightenment experience, and I can feel that you're tuned in. So you you know to how to trust this, how to allow yourself to be this open energy, is um, that's that's really what practice is: is learning how to let it be fully embodied. That's what most most people have awakening, but that's the beginning because all, most of what people are learning these days, I think is allowing full embodiment to happen. Now, if you want to come, I have, I mean, myself, I have a regular uh, group here in the city. If you're interested, there's information out there on okay. some of what I'm doing. You know, people are welcome, by the way, to sign up for the newsletter or take a newsletter or Good. information there if you're interested. I wanted to mention that. But, you know, um, it's, there's a lot of support available now, more than there ever has been. I mean, back in the old days, you'd have to go, and wait for someone to come for six months or go to India or something like that. And now it's like, you know, it's like Starbucks. There's one in every corner. So. <laughs> you, just have to, you have to just be able to know who's, who you can trust. You know, that's, that's another question. But I don't think I have enough time to go into that right now. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. So well, I just want to be clear on the time. If my watch says 10 to 12, so what's our what's the, we have five more minutes at least. for questions? We only take five minutes for announcements. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that cool? Okay, good. Hi. Thank you, Jim. Sure. For a very spacious talk, it's <laughs> really wonderful. You know, you mentioned um, how the awakening is different for each individual, and um, the unfolding. The unfold. The essence of it is universal. Right. And so I wonder, and, and that, you know, nobody can follow another's path. It can point the way, maybe, but... And I wonder if that's maybe the, <clears throat> the pitfall of being a seeker. Mm -hmm. It's always looking for something outside or just beyond, you know, reach. And I'm wondering if you can... Um, or maybe that's what Suzuki Roshi meant when he said the most important thing is to find the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's different for each person. So I'm wondering if you could just you know, give your thoughts on how one can maybe transition from the path of being a seeker and looking and finding, and, oh, here's a, here's a modality and here's a modality and all that stuff, and finally, you know, like step away and let that go. Beautiful question. So we, we need a whole day now <laughs> and, uh, just to get started. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, all I can say is that if seeking is happening what's important isn't that seeking is happening what's important is that there's an awareness of that when one is caught in being a seeker one doesn't even know one is grasping when you begin to develop awareness, a kind of more spacious attention, then there's a perspective possible that actually can sense and feel the constriction of the longer, the seeker. Because that's, a pain, that's, a, that's suffering. It's a struggle. It's wanting something. So the, the key here isn't to get rid of the seeker or to transcend it or even to understand it. But to, some, but to fully allow it without any struggle with it. That's what compassion is. That's what acceptance is. And true compassion, true acceptance are not, contrary to what people might think, are not psychological. They can be, but that's still in the relative perspective. The, 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 per, the perspective of awareness, of acceptance and compassion that is transformative is that true nature. The thing that we don't understand maybe at that point is that that's truly what we are. And at some point, awareness, awareness realizes itself. That's what awakening is. And in that moment, there is no seeking anymore. There is the end of seeking. Now, I know for me there was a point where there was completely the end of that. I don't have, we don't have time to go into that. But I think there's also moments of that until that full dropping away happens. So you learn how to 
be available so that each moment of the seeker being fully allowed. When the seeker is fully allowed to be the seeker, you are not the seeker anymore. I don't know if that's helpful. You're not in the identity anymore. Because freedom is really freedom from identity. Belief is identity. So we become free of belief. That's what I meant by that you can't follow another path. It's if, you have, if you're in your head about it and you have this concept about it, that's what I meant. It doesn't mean you can't sit and follow the breath and do the, They can be very, very helpful. In fact, almost essential for many, many. I think for me, I don't. I don't regret one minute of the decades I spent on the cushion. So, yeah, mm-hmm. you're welcome. Am I done? No, I was going to have a question. Right, comment. Just I wanted to thank you for, um, the, especially this one image you gave of emotions telling the heart, saying that the heart wants to open up. Yeah. Because I'm a very fear-based person, and I'm going to use that now as like when I'm afraid. Oh, my heart wants to open up. It doesn't actually want to close. Yeah, it, up. it gives you the possibility of finding a place of trust where you can let that maybe percolate a little bit more. Not to push it. Not to expect it to fully release. None of that, because that doesn't work, right? But as you begin to do that, you'll begin to see that it. You know, you'll begin to see how it's wanting to move. And that's, you know, no one can take that away from you. That's not a belief. That's the real guidance system that I was talking about. You'll begin to trust within you. Yeah, sure, you're welcome. Please. My name is Asa, thank you. Um, you I, I enjoyed listening to your history. You've a lot of stuff that you just really... I'm, I'm having trouble hearing mm, you. Sure. Um, you talked about your history, and one of the things I was connecting with is in 69 uh, and that period leading up, and of course this, the Supreme Court uh, decision that recently uh, came about. Mm-hmm. And you know, part of that experience, I reflect on the uh, rainbow flag and what have you, and where we've been and where we've gone and the progress. But one of the things that comes to concern to me is, for example, the Confederate flag, for example, Mm -hmm. is there. And it's something that we just, apparently, we just can't seem to deal with that from the relative perspective, the uh, ultimate perspective. But it's not something that we deal with. It's not something that we talk about. And it continually emerges. And, you know, it's like this wall here. It's like one big Confederate flag. It's a way of understanding, a way of understanding um, what is this? You know, the Civil War only ended like 120 years ago. So right. we're not far from this. Right. But we want to be far from this. We mm-hmm. want Obama to be the savior, which, of course, we now know he's not. So the reality is, I, I love the thing. You used the word, you said the word passion once in your, uh, you said rage, actually, once in your talk. I like that word. But um, so we've got gay liberation, we've got gay marriage, we've got transgender, this and that, but we still are dealing with you know nine African Americans and a senator being murdered by Dylan Roof, right, with his symbols, right? But these are our symbols, that's us too. Tikna Han says, I am I am this I am this slaver and the enslaved. So right. I just I guess the question I have is how much are we, and I've been here for about, I've come here for about you know, maybe 10, 15 years, how much time do we, how much energy do we give to liberating this civil war reality? I mean, if, we, if, we don't, if we refuse to talk about it, which I think, for example, this song, I, 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 I don't know how many times that issue of race, right, you know, black, you know, black males getting shot, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff, now we're dragging, you know, women out of cars and saying they got hung in the jail. So this is this will continue to go on until we decide to give it consciousness. So I just want to put that out, put that whole issue out around. You know, because when you walk through your thing, I was walking through mine also, right. and I was looking, oh yeah, you know, this guy, you know, so I, from my perspective, it's sort of like you're riding on top of the wave, and so we're drowning all the way. You talk about economics, we're clearly aware that the average African-American family is about worth $11,000 in the average white family is worth about 
40 thousand dollars. This is crazy statistics about housing, healthcare, education on down the line. And I just think that in terms of liberation, uh, we're sort of celebrating AIDS is over in the white community, you know, we got marriage and we've got adoption, we've got all these things, but we still got this, this really this Confederate flag thing going on. So let's put that out there because it's uh, it's uh, it, the time is now, you know, the time is now. Well, I hear you, I hear you, and you're bringing up a lot of really, you know, important things that are uh, true, and uh, I. I wish I, we had more time to really talk, but I, I'll tell you what my fantasy is, okay? And I don't know, this is, this is not an answer, but uh, it's certainly, uh, my, my fantasy for humanity is that we have a um, pandemic virus that enlightens everybody <laughs> and frees everybody from all of their beliefs and conditioning. That, of course, is a, is a wonderful fantasy, but... Um, <coughs> You know, I think that we, I, I think um, Mother Teresa pointed out very succinctly when she said, it's not possible to accomplish great things, only small things with great love. And I think there was a point in my own um, unfoldment where I realized, as many people remember this probably, that fighting for peace was like fucking for chastity. And um, yet you had to, to really you know, evoke peace, you had to find that within yourself first. And I think that's why Thich Nhat Hanh is such a great example of somebody who worked for peace, was actually nominated by Martin Luther King for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1972 for his work trying to have peace between North and South Vietnam. And of course, his people were killed on both sides because they couldn't believe somebody wasn't on one side or the other. And so I think that what really has to happen on a human level uh, is for people to be, in order for people to understand another perspective, they have to get beyond their own. So the work that people are, the work that people are doing here in this room is, the, is sowing the seeds for people to move humanly in a place where they're not caught in their position. And I think then things will start to really change more, if we're going to survive on this planet, which is questionable. <laughs> anyway, thanks for your question. Appreciate it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, now's the time we just uh, make announcements. So the host, so I'm your host. There are snacks on the table. There are cups for tea. So feel free to help yourself. If you use a cup, please wash it and put it on the rack to dry. If you are new and want to be on the mailing list, there's a sign-up sheet on that wall there on the other side of that and please give us your email and your physical address. Uh, let's see, what else? You're going to talk about Donna and uh, I'll come around with the bowl. Can I make a quick, and also I just want to say in case I did mention briefly, but some of my materials on the table, so if you're interested in any of that, feel free. There's stuff to take and something. Very good. Okay. And one last thing. Some of us meet at 1230 near the front door for lunch. And uh, I noticed there's a, there's a flyer about the retreat. Does anybody want to give a spiel about the retreat? Sure. <laughs> uh, somebody. So as, as Grisha mentioned, there are uh, beautiful flyers uh, out to the right on the table. Uh, our annual retreat is September 18th to, to the 20th at Vajrapani Institute in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, our teacher this year is David Lewis. And uh, if you haven't been to a retreat, please uh, speak to me or somebody who has. It's a really sweet weekend. Thanks. Okay, any other announcements? Yes. Yes, um, in three weeks, um, August 14th and 15th at St. Ignatius, the um, San Francisco Choral Society is performing Mozart's Requiem and Vespers. There's a fantastic program in the gorgeous setting, and we're really blowing the roof off. Mozart's record is he wrote it as he was dying. He didn't complete it. He left notes. And this this guy named Susan. What, what's the date again? 14th and 15th. <coughs> St. Ignatius. And it's uh, it's extraordinarily powerful. It oh. is it is uh, um, almost unique in choral music for its fast power. It just grabs you by the nuts. 
Speaker, which makes me think next week is an open discussion. Is that open discussion? So next week is open discussion. All right. Um, we should discuss the dedication of marriage unless right. you want to do it your own. No, that's fine. I'll do yours. Okay. I know. That's fine. Okay. 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 By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.